Alors, bonjour, je m'appelle Stéphanie McFadden, je travaille avec Santé Canada. Je vais faire ma présentation en anglais, mais les questions, si on a le temps après, sont bienvenues en français aussi. I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, we recently revised the Canadian guidelines for drinking water quality. We worked very closely with the US EPA in 2015, the work that Sébastien mentioned uh, around the children's number that the US EPA released. Um, that was part of the work that we did in collaboration with the US EPA. Um, that work has been the basis for updating our guidelines for Canadian drinking water quality for cyanobacterial, cyanobacterial toxins. The resulting guideline technical document has now undergone a peer review as well as public consultation um, and it has undergone its final revisions and we are just now in the eternal federal government process of trying to actually get that published someday soon. Um, it has actually been approved as a final guideline by the Federal Provincial Territorial Committee on Drinking Water since late 2016. So it's almost impressive how long we take. The current maximum acceptable concentration for cyanobac cyanobacterial toxins um, dates back to 2002, and it is 1.5 micrograms per liter. The new guideline for Canadian drinking quality, shocker, is 1.5 micrograms per liter. That is our proposed guideline, um, which, uh, spoiler alert, is what the final guideline is going to be. Um, Canadian jurisdictions have been meeting that 1.5 micrograms per liter for a long time, um, since that level has actually been in place since 1999, although the formal guideline date is 2002. Um, from a health perspective, we calculated a health-based value that actually came out to 2 micrograms per liter, and I will talk a little bit about how that's done. It's derived from a 28-day study in rats, um, published also in 1999 by Heinz. Um, The decision around leaving that number at one and a half micrograms per liter is basically because the Canadian jurisdictions are already meeting that guideline, there didn't seem to be a lot of logic in raising it to two micrograms, which would afford very questionable additional health protection um, and uh, little to no cost savings. So in order to derive that health-based value, uh, as I mentioned, we use a key study by Heinz 1999, which is a 28-day rat study that identified a lowest observed adverse effects level of 50 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day based on liver effects. Um, you can see the math up there. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, the uncertainty factors, the UF you see up there stands for uncertainty factors, and that is where we differ a little bit from some of our partners with the US EPA or with the World Health Organization in making the decisions around what uncertainty factors to use. You can see there's an uncertainty factor of 900, which is not insignificant. That's times 10 for intraspecies variability, times 10 for interspecies variability, times 3 for data de database deficiencies, and times 3 for the use of a lowest observed adverse effects level instead of a no observed adverse effects level, which is our preference. 70 kilos is the average body weight of a Canadian adult, which again explains part of the difference between the Canadian number and the World Health Organization, which is at one microgram per liter. Um, using global body weight statistics lowers that body weight. <laughs> so. Um, The allocation factor, which is the 80%, is a ceiling value allocation factor that Health Canada uses in these calculations. Um, it indicates that the majority of the exposure to microsystems is expected to be through drinking water. The remaining point two of the allocation allows for other non-negligible exposures from other media, such as food or recreational exposure. Um, And one and a half per liters per day is the average daily volume of drinking water consumed by a Canadian adult. Uh, it's used in uh, the calculation of all of our chemical guidelines. The proposed maximum acceptable concentration applies to total microsystems. So although it is based on the toxicity of microsystem LR, um, it is intended to apply to all of the measurable vari microsystem variants within your sample. So it's deemed to be protective in that way against exposure to all of those variants. Uh, the other major difference is that the current guideline of one and a half micrograms liter was based on a lifetime exposure, and the new one and a half micrograms is a seasonal exposure. This is in recognition, um, uh, first of all, to use the shorter term study, um, but it's also recognition of the kind of exposure we see in Canada and the mounting body of evidence that even shorter term exposures can have a fairly quick impact. Those liver effects show up fairly quickly. 
The special considerations, um, Health Canada also put some special considerations in for infants. Um, the animal data that we examine actually indicates that fetuses and infant animals are less sensitive to MCLR than adults, but there's not a lot of scientific evidence upon which to base infant or children-specific data. Um, and then given the fact that human infants consume up to five times more drinking water co comparatively for their body weight than an adult, we adopted a precautionary approach, um, which means that we have put in fact a reference value, which is unusual. Normally our guidelines, we try to have only one health-based value, but within this guideline, you will find a reference value of the 0.4 micrograms per liter using exactly the same math as what was used to derive the one and a half micrograms per liter, but based on an infant's consumption and body weight. We also considered the other cyanotoxins that are out there. As I said, this is based on microcystin LR, um, but when we considered the data on cylindrospermopsin, um, but based on limited science, um, we decided that we could not derive a credible maximum acceptable concentration, um, as well as the fact that uh, it also factored in that we had very little to no data on the occurrence in Canada, and one of the requirements for producing a Canadian guideline for drinking water quality is that we actually be exposed to it in Canada. Otherwise, we create an obligation for our communities to test for something that may not actually be there. It's a bit of a chicken and egg. How do we know it's there if we don't insist people test for it? But there are cost considerations that come into play as well. The same was true of anatoxin A. Uh, the toxicity data was insufficient for deriving a health-based value in drinking water. I'm not going to talk a lot about the analytical considerations or the treatment considerations because you have some very knowledgeable people in this room who are going to talk about those as the day goes on. So um, I will just mention to you that our guideline does focus, as I mentioned, on total microsystems. So our recommendation from Health Canada is that all measurable microsystem variants, both intra and extracellular, be captured in your measurement. Um, the, we do not specify which method you have to use. Instead, as with most of our guidelines, we talk about what available methods are out there. ELISA, PPIA, LCMSMS, HPLC, UV. There are limitations and benefits to each of those methods. Um, Sebastian mentioned a few of them, and well, you know I'm very excited about this research because I'm hoping that in the future we'll be able to do a little bit better in terms of what we recommend or what we suggest is out there for people to use. At the moment, based on what Canadian labs are able to do, familiar with, um, and what communities are doing anyway, the ELISA is the method of choice for looking for microcystin. Um, the ADDA method, is the preferred method. Um, Health Canada also recommends that once you have a positive hit, you do some additional physical chemical analysis and at least a portion of the samples. The reason for this is to get an understanding of what variants are present in your source water because you won't get that just from the ELISA testing. And it is important to understand what variants are there as there's differences in the treatment considerations that are important from a human health perspective. Um, again, not gonna talk a lot about treatment because you're gonna hear about that um, quite a bit, I think, in some aspects of these presentations. There, uh, you can see up on the slide, and the presentation will be available for you, um, some of the conventional filtration, of the, of some of the methods that are being used and that are proven to be fairly effective. Um, I think uh, it was mentioned that some research um, in Canada around the accumulation and, and release of toxins in a conventional treatment plant um, from people right here at this school, uh, and it was, it was actually something that had a fairly big influence on the team that was reviewing the guidelines, and so it is most certainly highlighted, and it's something that has uh, the work, the excellent work that was done here really raised awareness of that particular issue. Um, the good news is, is that based on all of the data that we collected in trying to update this guideline is that the treatments in plants in Canada can generally achieve treated water cons concentrations that are well below the pro proposed uh, health-based guideline. In the guideline, you'll also find a description of how we recommend you apply it. Um, we do start with the uh, classic visual monitoring for the routine presence of uh, cyanobacteria. With all of the flaws that come along with that, we are well aware that you may not be able to see a bloom. It's may not, visual cues may not be sufficient, but we are also stuck with what we're stuck with. Right? So this is what people, uh, this is the first step. Um, if there are signs of a bloom potentially affecting a drinking water intake, we do recommend that there be a toxin analysis of the treated water. We also recommend that raw water samples be collected uh, so that you have a better understanding of both influent and effluent at your treatment facility. 
And if microcystins are detected in the treated water at concentrations up to and including the maximum acceptable concentration, monitoring should continue. However, if the microcystins are above the reference value of 0.4, authorities have to consider informing the public about using alternative safe, safe sources of water for infant formula in particular. Um, this is the very simple and straightforward flowchart that will appear in the back of the guideline. In 13 easy steps or less, you will know exactly what to do if you find microcystins in your water. I won't go into the details of that. There is a lot of explanation that goes along with it, even within the guidelines itself. I will mention a few of the public consultation comments that we received because they do influence the final guideline and, and the decisions that we make at the end of the day. Um, there was certainly a lot of concern around the uh, information for infants because that's a new uh, bit of information that did not show up in the old guideline. Um, it was not, in no small part influenced by the US EPA's work around producing a number for children, um, which they do as a matter of policy in developing their health values. Um, it, it did lead to us to have to consider what we would do, whether we would have something, because we are not usually in the place of having to put in two numbers. So we had, in the end, we do have a reference level um, for applicable to bottle-fed infants only, uh, which is a little departure. The US's number applies to all children six and under. Um, but as I mentioned, that is as much policy reason as anything else. So there is often differences. Um, People wanted to know why we chose a MAC of 1.5 versus 2 micrograms per liter, and I have explained that a little bit. There did not seem to be a benefit in lowering the health-based value. We will do that on occasion if it turns out that new science solidly justifies it. In this case, the difference was not enough to make that worthwhile. Um, and the, uh, sorry, ELISA, um, there was a lot of recommendations that ELISA only be used as a screening method because we, we, uh, we do allow it as a, allow it, Health Canada doesn't have, make the rules the provinces do, <laughs> but we certainly um, consider ELISA as a, a reasonable way to be looking at your microcystin concentrations in water, um, and there was a lot of concern about that because of the fact that it is not a quantitative method that allows you to differentiate between the variants. Um, there was also a lot of uh, a requests for guidance on how to interpret the sample results depending on the analysis methods. Um, and some of that has to do with the way that laboratories report results, which don't give, depending on the user who's receiving those, they don't give a lot of information on what that is. Um, and so some of the advice we've put in there, more aimed at communities than individuals, but is around ensuring that municipalities have discussions with their laboratories to understand what methods are being used, what um, uh, what conditions things are being tested under, try to get as much information around how the testing is being done as possible in order to interpret the results accurately. accurately. Um, so I think in the interest of not going over time, um, I will just let you know where things stand at the moment. So as I mentioned, the final guideline was approved by our Federal Provincial Territorial Committee on Drinking Water in October of 2016. Um, in our sort of labyrinthine process, it was approved by another committee in July of 2015, and sometime this year, if the stars align, it will be available on the web. Um, one important consideration for that is we're actually currently working on updating our recreational water quality guidelines, um, and those include some recommendations around cyanotoxins. Um, we will be using exactly the same key study and the same math for the human health effects. And so, uh, you know, as a spoiler again, for the current recreational water quality guideline for Canadian waters is 20 micrograms per liter. It will be significantly lower just based on the fact that it's a short-term study versus a lifetime study in the past. Um, we are also trying to look at what sort of information around cell numbers or um, biomass might be useful in helping manage recreational water better. Um, I think that, oh, the other important point here is that most of Health Canada's guidelines for chemicals uh, tend to be put in place and then sit there for 25 to 30 years. <laughs> this science is advancing very rapidly, and there was a fairly compelling case made, um, which is why you got me today instead of one of our toxicologists, for the fact that this is a little different from other chemicals and that we are talking about a living organism that is producing a toxin, and therefore there are a lot of other factors in play. So we have... 
um, wisdom prevailed, I think, and we have um, put microcystins on the same sort of timeline as our microbiological guidelines, which means that every five to, let's call it 10 years, <laughs> they will be revised. So just about in time for the Atrap project to be publishing hopefully some really useful results for us, we will be back in a place where we can review this guideline and actually be influenced by the latest science. So I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Or...